morning, everybody. Who's excited to be back at Pebble Beach? Come on, how good is this? Thank you all so much for coming this morning. My name's Jim Schwartzkopf. I'm part of Alliant Private Client Group. We specialize in insuring people with passions, and, uh, and this is certainly uh, one of the largest ones that we get involved with. Been uh, very excited to be part of uh, Pebble Beach now for, I think this is our fifth or sixth year, uh, not counting last year. Uh, we're with our partners, AIG Private Client Group, one of the best in the business, insuring uh, uh, collector cars and homes and yachts and everything else. So um, very excited you're here. We've got a great panel today. Uh, I'm gonna allow John Nickus to uh, introduce the rest of the folks. John is a award-winning automotive writer and enthusiast. And I just learned he's the uh, executive director of the Madison Avenue Sports Car Driving and Chowder Society. So it sounds like a good guy to talk to. So thanks so much. Thanks so much. So we're going to have a very special forum this time, and we're going to do it a little differently because we have so many VIPs arrayed here, but I'll actually introduce the panelists now. The first, of course, is my good friend Leslie Kendall, the chief historian from the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles. Paul Hageman was the youngest judge in the history of the Pebble Beach Concord Elegance. He currently is the president of Hageman Motor Cars um, and, of course, has grown up in the hobby. <laughs> Jay Ward has a title too long for even me to remember. He is the franchise custodian and creative director for Pixar's Cars franchise. Jay Ward. So I know, Jay, you are the custodian of the Cars franchise, but that makes it sound like you clean up the oil spots. I've never heard that term before, actually. It's good. Caroline Cassini has literally grown up in the classic car hobby and, of course, the daughter of the eminently famous Judge Joseph Cassini. She is now the current general manager of the market, Bonham's new online platform. Caroline. And then last but certainly not least is Tabitha Hammer, the president and CEO of America's Automotive Trust, which includes the LeMay, America's Automotive Museum, America on Wheels Museum, and the RPM Foundation, Tabitha. So when it came time to pick a topic for this year's forum, Sandra had suggested we do something with a forward-looking bent. And I had thought about it for a little bit, and we decided we would talk about what the lawn at Pebble Beach will look like in 2050, when Pebble Beach will celebrate its 100th anniversary. And I thought that was a great idea. I could bring in my friends, and then Sandra threw a wrench into the equation when she said, and I would love a panel that will still be alive in 2050. <laughs> be so in 2050, you can actually compare what they said today with what's on the lawn and hold them accountable. Before we get started, Leslie, for those of us that aren't as familiar with the history of Concord Elegance, what were the original competitions like and what was their original purpose? Well, the original, the, the whole idea is if you have something, if, if you're wealthy and you have a, you've spent a great deal of money and a great deal of time on something to carry you around, you don't want to hide it. You don't want to put it into a garage or a stable. You want to drag it out and you want to show it. And that's what the, the, uh, the gentry, the, the uh, intelligentsia did. When were the first Concord Elegances for automobiles held? Uh, I, I believe that was um, in the early, the early 1900s. Um, Le Petit Journal did a, a, um, a whole piece of it. They, in fact, they devoted their um, cover to, to the, the first uh, Conqueror um, uh, Auto Sans Chevaux. So obviously, because the automobile at that point is really only 25 years old, all these competitions were for new cars, correct? Yeah, they were for new cars. There, were, there weren't, by definition, any old cars. And, and uh, I don't know that uh, horse-drawn carriages did or didn't compete. I, all the things I've seen, um, they've been missing. But, but, but it's, it's interesting how, they, how you know, humankind so readily 
took to horse, horseless carriages. Well, even this event, which is one of the oldest Concours in America's, the first five winners at Pebble Beach were all modern cars. It was an Edwards, it was a Jaguar, it was a Jaguar, it was a Healy, and then it was a Jaguar. And Leslie, what starts the modern era at Pebble Beach? Well, there are a couple things um, that started the modern era, and I think everybody remembers Phil Hill. Um, his, his win in 1955 with the 31 Pierce Arrow, um, a gorgeous, lovely car um, that was built for his aunt, and he said, you know, this thing is still grand. I, you know, I spent a lot of time restoring it. It's still every bit a Concours contender. They don't make them like this. This is, this is how I can stand out. This is how I'm going to stand out, and I'm going to present this car. And he, I don't think he was expecting to win. Derek, can you get a microphone? What did your dad talk about when he spoke about that seminal win in 1955 with the Pierce Arrow? You know, I think it was, it was just a random happenstance that that was uh, his hobby, and he, it was sort of his relaxing uh, time off from racing. To, to, and, you know, in 1953, a couple of years before, he was having um, health issues. The, the racing was giving him a lot of anxiety, and his doctor sort of insisted, uh, you need to take the year off, you need to stop racing. And he contemplated stopping racing in 53. So that's when he decided, I'm gonna restore my aunt's car uh, with his brother. And you know, he started coming to Pebble Beach, very important road races and the supporting event. It was like the best of both worlds for my father. And he loved that car. He had been driving it uh, to USC and back and just drove it around like a regular road car, his aunt's Pierce Arrow and thought, why not bring it up and enter it in the show? And um, I'm sure it was a complete surprise that, that he was awarded best of show. He had just gotten out of the car, was working on his car, and there's a picture, the famous picture of his greasy pants standing there getting his best of show award. But the races were the big event back then. You know, that was, that was kind of a smaller sideshow, the Concours, anyhow, which grew more in prominence when the races uh, left. But... Still, he cleaned up that weekend, having won the race and best of show. Only Phil Hill could have done that, and it's interesting that that really marks the change at Pebble Beach, because from that time in 1955 until 1968, there would not be another modern car um, that would take best of show. And in 1968, Leslie, it was a 1964... 64 Maserati. A 64 Maserati Mistral, and then it's another, I'm not going to do the math, but until 2014, when we get another, mo uh, well, at least modern car in the post-war sense. Paul, do you remember that moment? I do, because I think that, you know, I grew up with 50s and 60s cars being modern cars, right. and pre-war cars were classic cars. So it was always a pre-war event, and I just remember thinking and sort of hoping in my head that maybe this is the chance for a post-war best of show, and then it would be a runner-up, or it wouldn't make it out of class. And I remember actually being disappointed at times, thinking there are some great post-war cars here that deserve to be considered. So when it actually happened, it was sort of like, okay, we can do this. Um, and obviously a hugely deserving car. And I think one of the things that's made this concourse so much more interesting in recent years is because the field of potential candidates for best of show has just been broken wide open and it makes it so much more fun. Can someone on this side hand a microphone to Ed Gilbertson? And Ed, of course, is the former chief judge at uh, Pebble Beach. From a slightly older perspective, Ed, as we work out the microphones, um, like what was it like here. when you saw that 375 roll up there? Well, that was very exciting because, uh, like, Paul says we'd been waiting for a post-war car to be up there on the ramp as a best of show, and we finally got one. And I was particularly excited at the time because my specialty was Ferrari. I think most of you know, before I became chief judge at Pebble Beach, I'd been chief class judge for the Ferrari classes at uh, Pebble Beach for 15 years. So I was so excited. It's been a popular winner, and I think as time goes by, we'll see more post-war cars up there.
I completely agree. And now let's kind of look ahead to 2050. So, and I say this with the utmost affection. So in 2050, the prime age earners will be between 45 and 55 years old. And I think a great many of them will have become car enthusiasts through the Cars franchise, which are not real cars. So Jay, because they didn't grow up loving real automobiles, but fictional ones, how do you think that will change the things that they look at and the things that they covet in the future? Well, it's funny you said, you know, they're not real cars, but to the kids who grew up watching the movie, they're very real. Um, and, and honestly, I think the, the movie Cars, what we didn't intend to do, but what it ended up doing was it educated kids about classic cars. And if you watch the movie, the classic cars are the cool ones. I mean, Sally was a 996 Porsche, which wasn't the latest 911, but she was, we wanted her to be that car. Uh, Doc Hudson, I, I remember we did a, uh, an Art of Cars exhibit down at the Peterson after the movie came out, and this old guy came up to me with like literally tears in his eyes, and he said, I've got a Hudson Hornet, and my grandkids never wanted to spend time with me, and now every weekend, they want to go out in my, hut, in my, in my Hudson. And I was like, <laughs> wow. And I realized that uh, we have a, an ability and a power through media to make an emotional connection, right? When you watch a film and you walk out and you have an emotional connection, you want to be part of that world. And I think um, that the film Cars has allowed kids to have an emotional connection with vehicles that maybe wouldn't have been there. So um, just to answer the question, I think if more kids have seen that movie that, that grow up, probably have a deeper love and understanding of different makes and marquees and old cars versus new than maybe a child who hadn't seen the movie. So I'm actually happy about that. I mean, it really is amazing. And, you know, Leslie, I spent a lot of time at the Peterson. It's, there is a Lightning McQueen on the second floor, and I'm consistently stunned by how many people will stop at that car and spend more time looking at it. Do you feel a great responsibility as you kind of develop the franchise to continue to include cars that kids might not otherwise know? I mean, yeah, yes, we, we do try to feature vehicles that are unique, but the main reason that we cast a vehicle is because of the story of that car. So going back to the first film again, we had to have a World War II Jeep because that car was so iconic for what it did during the war. Um, we wanted to have a Volkswagen bus as the hippie because that is the essential vehicle of Woodstock, right? Um, all those cars were cast because they had cultural significance that they were living characters. They were, they were the embodiment of what that car represented. So I do think we try to continue to do that. And Lightning McQueen, people say, was that a Chevy? Is it a Ford? What? It's an in-house design. We designed Lightning McQueen, but we took really essential cues from race cars that we were inspired by to make that car. And that's what makes it so cool is it's, we added a vehicle to the car, to the real world of cars. So that's kind of neat. So Caroline and Paul, you're the two youngest people on this panel. Um, do you remember when Cars came out? I do, I do, and that's the thing. When it, growing up in in the car world and coming to the Pebble Beach since I was three, you know, you asked me this question earlier about whether or not I appreciated pre-war automobiles uh, at a young age, and I honestly didn't. But my dad was just such an incredible mentor, and he took me to to RM Restorations, and we picked colors, and and that's why you know I really have a passion for these pre-war automobiles. But I I do remember when cars came out, and it's actually really funny now because it's full circle because I ended up working for Fantasy Junction, which is a dealership right across from Pixar. So literally across the street, yeah. yeah. Literally, and I heard from some of your coworkers that you actually had some people come out to fantasy and, and sketch and draw and sit on the floor to, to look at some of the automobiles and maybe, you know, inspired some of the cars, cars. Yeah. That's, that's true. Um, so cars came out 15 years ago now. It's hard to believe it's 2006. And at the time we had a lot of animators at street, but they weren't car people. And I was a car person already. And so I taught a class at Pixar called Automobile 101, where I literally taught them the history of the car. So they understood that. But then we had people that were doing lighting uh, that had to light the vehicles because they're CG computer. And I took them over to Fantasy Junction. You guys have those cool roof panels where the light comes in on the cars. And if you guys watch the beginning of the movie Cars, the logo comes down and it's actually a cloisonne looking 3D logo. The lights, the reflection on that logo is the roof of Fantasy Junction. That's the light pattern. So a little secret insider tip there. I never knew that. Is that mine, of course? Yes. Once again, a, a hilt saves the day. A mechanic, uh, renaissance man, furniture repair, racer. Come on, you're making us look bad. 
you know, Caroline, you grew up with these amazing pre-war cars. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say that you didn't appreciate them from an early age and you had to get your dad's mentorship. Tabitha, as you have this incredible responsibility running America's Automotive Trust, do you think it's part of your mission to educate young people about perhaps cars they might not otherwise appreciate? Absolutely, yes, and it should be every single person in this room's mission, um, no matter what way you do that, whether it's through opening a door of one of your cars or taking uh, someone to a museum or just um, introducing them to those vehicles. I think that one of the great things about cars is it brought these vehicles to a level where the kids and even teenagers and parents um, could really relate to that vehicle. It's not out of reach. It made it a little more real for them. And I think we see that through some of the uh, video games as well, right? You have Forza and all of these other games that the kids are learning about the cars. And they've done such a good job, like Jay did, in telling those stories and being really uh, specific to bringing the historical aspect to it in a fun, creative way. And I think that we, we can't lecture the kids. We can't stand there and say, this automobile was important because it won this race, this way, race, and that race. They don't have that point of view. They don't have that relevancy to it. So when we, when we give them that experience, it makes them real. It, it creates their story with the vehicle and then a lifelong fan. You know, I'm curious, because Paul, you're the only judge here that really grew up as a judge. As you come to this, do you think your perspective is going to change over time where you will begin to treat post-war cars with the same reverence that perhaps pre-war cars were always treated with? Uh, uh, yes, I think is the shorter answer. And I think, you know, just like the Concours evolved, the judging at the Concours evolved. You know, it's... Um, it's one of those things we look at preservation differently. Um, we look at over-restoration differently. Um, I've been on teams where we have deducted points because of over-restoration, and part of that is about preserving these cars for the future. So I think, you know, as significant a role as the judging team plays in the future of the Concour, it all has to continue to change, and, and a good judge is an open-minded judge. Richard, can you grab a microphone? So Richard Adato, of course, in addition to being a fantastic automotive historian writer, is also on the selection committee at Pebble Beach. Richard, do you think, uh, God willing, you survive another five or ten years, um, that you will... I hope so. <laughs> that you will intentionally widen the group of cars that perhaps will be considered for entrance? In, in 2050, I'm sure we'll have classes that we don't have today. I'm sure we'll probably have an electric car, supercar class. I think that I wanted to say to Forza, the way that kids are learning about cars right now is by playing computer games. And like some you know, kids in the neighborhood came through my ar archive and they looked at a picture of a Bugatti 101 and they went, oh, Bugatti 101, oh, a Pagani. And it's all because of Forza. And this is where they're gonna be looking for that when they have the money to buy them 20 years later and when they, uh, just, you know, get excited about cars. This is what's their foundation. So when we think about perhaps what that lawn looks like in 2050, Tabitha, and you bring up Forza and things like that, but those are still older cars. Caroline, when will we see that sea change to really new cars, to maybe 21st century cars? I mean, do you think that will happen in 2050? You know, I think, like Richard said, there will be different classes. There will definitely evolve in that way. You know, we look at what's really, I think this conversation can also go into what will be collectible in 30 years, right? I mean, that's obviously a conversation that being in the industry and we talk about all the time. So when we think about what's going to be collectible, we think about preservation, I think, is going to be a really key factor in, in uh, 30 years. I think we'll look at, I think it'll won't be shocking if we have uh, some RSs or a 911 class that is preservation, because look at what's collectible these days. You look at, I mean, low miles is such a huge factor of what's collectible. And you look at, you know, original colors, original interior, you know, paint to sample for, you know, that's all really important for what's collectible. So I think it'll evolve to what be at Pebble Beach in 30 years. Rupert, can you run down to Richard and grab a microphone? 
as someone who's actively engaged in selling cars, have you personally witnessed this change in you know more modern vehicles becoming collectible and certainly a change in the buyers becoming younger? Oh, very, very much so. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about it. I, I, you know, I've been doing it about 30 years now, and we would not have had cars that were that modern in our auctions at all. There wasn't a margin to bring them to the public market, um, and it's just evolved incredibly. You know, I mean, literally, we look at the fact that we're selling Ford GTs as they come off their embargo, things like that. I mean, it, it is a completely different marketplace in that way. You know, Leslie, on the lawn at Pebble Beach, and actually this is actually for you, Paul too, I mean, the emphasis really has been on these coach-built motor cars. And I think that's always been kind of Pebble Beach's main is to celebrate coach-built motor cars. And of course, as we've become uh, more geared towards mass production, we have fewer and fewer coach-built cars where the only real coach-built cars are really kind of one-offs. Do you think we'll get more manufacturer's concepts and things like that on the lawn? Uh, uh, well, in, in a way, we, we have had those. We have the upper lawn that, that a lot of the concepts come out on. We have the, um, the main fairway on which we see, you know, cars, concepts in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, which, are, which belong there. I mean, they all, they all speak to creativity of automotive design. Um, Paul, do you think we'll ever get back to a Concorde that includes a fashion, um, you know, where people wear clothes from the distant past, like the 80s or 90s? <laughs> Sort of like Radwood. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I hope we don't head that direction here, but uh, uh, not that there's anything wrong with it. But I, I think um, there, there's always been an element of fashion, and I think the interesting thing in looking forward with Pebble is one of the, you know, is it's, and maybe to be a little bit old-fashioned about it, but I think there's something that collector cars, what we all believe are collector cars, have that modern cars do not have. And I think the interesting thing is, you flip through a fashion magazine, a men's magazine, what, you know, what are, what's in the background of these advertisements? It's old E-types, it's Porsches. More so than ever, collector cars are fashionable and they're desirable with a much broader spectrum of people. So I think uh, the future of the Concorde is of course younger individuals. I don't know that it's as much about younger cars. You know, it's interesting we talk about fashion because the most fashionable human being that I know is sitting in the front row um, directly straight ahead. Rupert, can you hand the microphone off to Ed Welburn? And as soon as I started talking about most fashionable person I know, Ed starts standing up straighter and cleaning his lapels <laughs> as if this was a fait accompli. I cannot believe this. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Ed, as you get further and further removed from your career, will we see things like the Aerotech on the lawn and other concepts and prototypes that we had at General Motors? Do you think we will have an appreciation for those cars that we might not have now? Well, I think in many ways, uh, what was on the upper lawn, as was mentioned earlier, will now be on the main lawn. And when it comes to that period of time, uh, and I do think those one-offs, those very special vehicles, will be a, a major part of what will be Pebble Beach in, in that period of time. So, you know, it's interesting. You're right, Leslie. So we do have the upper lawn. Eventually those cars will move down to the lower lawn. What about an expansion of the classes to include? You know, I had asked, I think, maybe 20 years ago, if we'll ever see a Japanese car class on the lawn, and I was explicitly told never, uh, not in my lifetime, but do you think that will happen? I, th I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, there was always, a, a, the collecting mindset has gotten so broad. And with my generation, we don't look at things as, oh, I'm only into European cars or, you know, it's because there's so much to choose from. There's interest in all directions. And I think, um, you know, I'm, a Porsche guy in a lot of ways. And I think for a long time, for example, Porsches were collected by Porsche people. And then it's sort of the collecting hobby, hobby at, lot, at large caught on to them. And now you see a Porsche in every great collection. I think Japanese cars are very much gonna be the same way where it's sort of like, 
It starts out niche. It gets broad from there. You know, Tabitha, as you kind of embark on this new career, having, you know, the ability to oversee these two fantastic museums, do you think that you will intentionally shape your exhibits with an eye towards the future and what younger people might appreciate? If we don't, we're dead. Um, plain and simple as that, we have to appeal to every demographic that enjoys cars or those who may not even know that they do enjoy cars yet, but finding those ways to bring it, like I said earlier, to realistic side for them and, and to show them a new world that they may not be aware of already. So yeah, absolutely, John. I mean, I think it has to be um, modern and keep up with some of the, the trends, um, but also be very embracing of all demographics, um, cars, people, everyone, and experiences to go along with that. When we talk about the fashion side of Pebble Beach, I think that something that we've all experienced is the lifestyle side of this event throughout the whole week. And it's it's more than just looking at the cars, right? It's here with your friends. It's uh, sipping champagne and planning your picnic and you make a lifestyle event out of it and you really get to enjoy the cars along with that. And so when we're looking at museums, we don't wanna be the, the static displays. We don't wanna be historic. We don't wanna seem old. We have to be relevant and fun and creative. And Peterson does such a great job of that as well. I mean, you guys are rocking it and uh, digital components, that engagement. Um, so we have to keep modern with that. What happens to some of these older cars as we talk about, you know, younger people, you know, being in, attracted to older, you know, to younger cars? What happens to, like, say, American folk classics from the pre-war era? Will they still find them interesting? I really do believe so, and I, I think I look back, and I, of course, I'm in love with pre-war cars, but I am a little bit of an anomaly when it comes to my generation. But when it comes to real cars that have made their mark, great Packards, great Duesenberg SJs, I mean, those cars will never, ever lose their value or ever, honestly, not, I think we'll always see a Duesenberg class at Pebble Beach because people truly appreciate what a Duesenberg is. And, and, you know, I talk about this a lot is what makes a car collectible or what makes a car really valuable is three aspects to me is engineering, aesthetics, and history. And something like a Duesenberg or a Botel Speedster, those are always going to be welcomed at Pebble Beach, absolutely. Ralph, can you grab the mic? You know, certainly you're one of the most talented designers to still be alive today. You've been responsible for some amazing vehicles. Do you think that as we progress towards perhaps autonomous driving vehicles and electrified cars and everything else, that cars will lose their sense of personality, marking maybe a termination point where we will no longer have, you know, certain cars on the field? Uh, no, actually, I think um, for us as a company, actually, we're in the process of doing that. We're a little late to the party, but we've been waiting to nail this electric car, car thing versus just jumping on the bandwagon. And brand preservation is more acute now because the powertrain, if you think about it, when we grew up, you'd look at DOHC. I remember, what does DH, DOHC mean? I didn't know it was double overhead cam. Marketing was about the powertrain. It was about the power, the size of the engine, the literage. Um, in the future, all of our cars are going to have the same electric motor, more or less, and 800 volt, 400 volt, and that's it. So the styling is, is what's left, the experience on the inside of the car. And we're finding that if you give up, let's say, 50 miles of range, because now if you obsess about range and every car has to have 500 miles of range, they're all going to look like fish. You know? <laughs> or, and that's where reason I'll, I always say there's a reason all airplanes look more or less the same, because they're all trying to get exactly the same result. Where we don't care, a Dodge may give up 100 miles of range and have a hell of a, of, a, of, a, of a character to the design. So that's what we're looking at. And we're making that compromise real time. And we're finding that, if anything, we have more freedom than ever because we're not spending as much money on the powertrain. I mean, to develop a V8 engine, a V6 engine, a turbo, it takes tens, in some cases, half a billion dollars for one engine family. Versus once you've invested in the powertrain on the electric system, you can have a field day with the rest. And that's what we're doing right now. I'm designing seven electric cars as we speak. You know, so. but you know, Ralph, you bring up an interesting point. So if function becomes the overarching principle in automotive design, then you know they all will look like airplanes. And so what you're saying is that certain brands will sacrifice that functionality to preserve their mark equity? Oh, yes. Yes. And there's a, I'm not going to spill the beans, but the next challenge, I'm, I'm actually hiring sound engineers 
something I've never done, not for the base, the stereo system, but for the character system. We're trying to give the cars character. Kind of if you look at what the movies, I love Star Wars movies because they give, uh, and Cars movies because they give spaceships these unique sounds that they don't really need to have. We're just doing it for fun. And that's what we're trying to say is cars can actually, they have to legally have to have a sound. Most people don't realize it, but it's mandated that at low speed so blind people don't get hit in the street, electric car have to make a sound. So why not design the sound? <laughs> well, you know, Jay, how different do you think things will look in 30 years on the lawn? I mean, if you were to just hazard a guess and putting you on the spot, what classes do you think might disappear, if any, and what classes do you think might be added? Well, I, I think Carolyn said it really well, is that, you know, classics are always classics. A Duesenberg is always interesting. I think what's great, one of the things that, uh, you know, Haggerty is doing with the youth judging is watching what kids resonate with may not be what you or I resonate with, but they pick old cars sometimes. They pick things based on what they emotionally connect with. And what Ralph is talking about is making an emotional connection with your vehicle, right? Because why do I buy one brand or another? It's because, oh my gosh, I love the way that looks or that sounds, right? If they all have an electric motor, then that's the next thing I gravitate to. So he's, first of all, he's spot on about what he's doing right now. So um, what, what that means for 30 now, years from now, I think you will have Japanese cars. I was this thing about a Toyota 2000 GT or, or a Mazda Cosmos. Like, I want to see that on the lawn. That's cool. I, I want to give a shout out to Bruce Meyer for helping get hot rods and customs on the lawn, which I love because he argued American hot rods of the pre and post war era was an intrinsically American culture that needed to be celebrated. So we can look at culture and say what automotive cultures need to be celebrated on the lawn, right? The, the, the era of these beautiful uh, pre-war classics was, uh, you know, opulence and wealth and I've got more than you and look how amazing this car is because they could do that. Post-war it changed, right? So those cultural things that are happening now, those may need to be amplified. Those stories may need to be amplified and have a class on the lawn. How do you think your dad would have felt about seeing these really kind of, to him, modern cars, because your dad really had, especially um, for his time, a real appreciation for older vehicles. I mean, he was probably the leader in kind of getting people to think about preserving these older cars and repairing them and eventually restoring them back to um, their, their original condition. I mean, how would he view this? Um. Well, I, one thing I would want to, to add to that earlier about, you know, thinking about 1955 with that Pierce Arrow winning Best of Show, that car was only 24 years old at the time. Um, 24 years ago, you know, was a 1997 car. So I don't think it, people were really wowed by this old Pierce Arrow winning Best of Show. You know, you look at the old photographs, there weren't that many people there. It was just really like, well, this was a quirky hobby for quirky people. And my dad admitted it, and, and I've heard others say it, that back in the day, um, in the late 70s and uh, 60s, and certainly in the 50s, if you were into pre-war classic cars, you were an oddball, and you, you were in a small group of people that, that were into that kind of thing. So to, to go out and restore and spend money on a car that was just 25 years old was kind of nuts to begin with. But I think because my father was, he was young, he was cool, he was a racing driver, he was winning races, and partaking in the hobby goes to that point. Having young people involved, letting them share the limelight, letting them bring their own personal interests into it and be rewarded for it is what sparks, I think, a lot of the passion in other people witnessing all that. Uh, sorry to answer your question, but uh, no, you can it, ask it again. It, you actually brought up an amazing point, Leslie. <laughs> and it's, it's really brought in a stark relief when you think about that. So 1997 would be the same time differentiation we have between that Pierce Arrow and now, as Derek brings up, will we ever get back to that again where we consider a 25-year-old car a full classic? Um, will we see a 1997 Dodge Spirit winning uh, next year? Well, maybe not next year, <laughs> a couple of years down the road. Um, but I think we're all making um, an important point. And from the museum perspective, presenting a Concours is like presenting a museum exhibition. Uh, it's like a pop-up exhibition. And in, in a way, the, the people who put on the Concours have kind of a, a, a duty 
to educate people on what's important, at the same time keeping their finger on the pulse of what people like, otherwise they're irrelevant and they have no business even being there. If, if, nobody, if nobody cares, then what are you doing? Um, and it's the same thing that we found as a museum. Um, you have to, sometimes things are important for it, they're not. I'm not saying that a concourse should you know, have a class on important cars, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that, that um, it's, you know, we've taken the time to educate ourselves a little bit more than a, than a lot of other people. And, and I think we, you know, we can, you know, pick, pick out some things and say that the time will come, maybe, maybe there'll be a minivan class. Um, who's, who, who's to say? So, Jay, do we have a minivan class on the horizon? No. What, what I was going to say is, look, looking back at cars from 1997, there, there's not... This is a good example. I went to the Detroit Auto Show one year when Lincoln brought back the Zephyr name again. And they had a 39 Zephyr coupe, which is one of the most stunningly gorgeous, you know, uh, E.T. Bob Gregory designs. And then they had the new Zephyr next to it. In the new Zephyr, it just it looked like sin dipped in misery. <laughs> and it, is it is still around? It's gone. That car doesn't deserve the Zephyr name, but what it really showed me was, you know, car design for a while, and it's just now coming out of it, was forced to make these very bland things because of engineering and safety and crumple zones. And I mean, poor Ralph, it's like as a designer, you have this gorgeous thing on paper, and by the time you get beat up by engineers, you get this thing at the other end that is not what you envisioned. That's why we always get disappointed when we see a show car versus a production car. And, and because of that, it makes it so hard to find these cars from... Uh, the 80s or 90s or 2000s that are like, oh, that's a future classic. There's so few of them that are really beautiful, achingly beautiful and sexy where you're like, that belongs on a lawn. There's very few. They, they exist, but it's rare. You go back before airbags, before crumple zones, before these things, design and aesthetics ruled because it was, again, making an emotional connection going, my God, it's achingly beautiful. I have to have that. And that's what we have on the lawn. These cars that you they're just stunning, and it's hard to find a stunning, st there's cool cars from the 80s and 90s, but there's not stunning, not that many stunning cars. Well, Ed Welburn, you are responsible for a lot of these cars that Jay is talking about, you know, having dominated this era. What cars from that period of time do you think will make their way onto the lawn? You know, I have to agree and disagree with <laughs> so Jay. So let's disagree because, with Jay because first. Because that, that, was, that was a difficult period. I'd say the most difficult is probably the 70s and 80s, where people, where rules changed overnight and people, it took them more than overnight to understand those new rules of safety and fuel economy. It was a very, very difficult period. Um, and I think the entire industry has grown out of that. And, and I don't consider them to be problems. Those were challenges and taking on a challenge can be exciting, it can be very rewarding, depending on who's handling that challenge. So uh, all of that I say is that I think that the cars that are being done now and those that will be or are coming in the next few years will be very exciting. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I just, I look at the Cadillac 16, right? That yeah. car, that was awesome. And that was here. And when it was here, there was a huge crowd around it. And if there was a production sedan DeVille next to it, I... And yeah. that Cadillac 16 had airbags and all of that, crash zones and all of that. It, it could have been a production vehicle. I, I John, know, I, I know. I, I think there's yeah, another Tabitha. component to it when we're thinking about the modern vehicles as well from the preservation or the restoration side, right? When we're talking about the full classics and the pre-war and post-war cars, there's an entire process on the concourse side of the restoration. And as more of these 80s, 90s, 2000 cars are more plastics and you know different forms, what is, what is gonna be around in 30, 40, 50 years? Um, my, my former husband and I had a restoration shop and about five or six years ago, we had a lady come in with her first generation Mazda Miata wanting it restored. And it was kind of a pivotal moment for me. And I'm thinking, wow, we have a Miata that they're wanting restored. But it also takes a completely different skill set to restore something from 80s, 90s, or 2000s than the 1920s or 30s. Well, Caroline, do you think that because of that, 
we're going to see an increase in the popularity of preservation cars or cars that have somehow survived the ravages of time, whether that's due to their construction materials or just wear and tear? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's when I said it, when it comes to, to also what is going to be collectible, absolutely, we are definitely going to see preservation be a huge part of it. I mean, for instance, you look at a beautiful gullwing that's been restored to different colors. It's not as collectible and not as desirable as an all original gullwing. Um, and I don't know if we're going to find any more. I mean, Peter Kumar has probably found all of them in every garage possible, but, but hopefully, you know, they're still, they're still out there. And I think people do so much appreciate preservation. I mean, I look at even some of the cars that my dad pre-war has restored. And I think if we looked back 20 years and had the same mindset, we might have kept some of those cars the way they were because they were savable. But we didn't because it was all about rest re restoring. I mean, my dad found that Auburn Bowtail Speedster um, that we brought, that really actually made me fall in love with cars when I was eight, and we restored it, but it was found in the back of a school bus. This guy gutted the school bus. And looking back at the pictures, actually, before he sold it, I was like, that was totally savable, totally. And I wish we did, but of course, it's, it's different mindsets and, and things change like that. You know, Paul, you talked about over-restoration earlier. I don't know if this is a gross generalization or not, but I think younger kids are more used to throwing things away rather than repairing them. Do you think that because of that, when they see patina or where they see originality, they will appreciate it more or appreciate it less? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask because for me, everything should have patina. So it's sort of, um, to me, it's, it's authentic, like I, I, that always makes me think of like Cobras, Speedsters, things that are highly replicated, right? So I look at those cars and when I see a restored one, I think, oh, well it'd look better with patina because it, it's more authentic, right? And I think, you know, you've got, cars is one of these weird, it, it is an art form, right? It's a collectible. In collectible watches, any sort of replacement of parts or resurfacing kills the value, antiques kills the value. Restoration work on art, in a lot of cases, kills the value. So here we are with something that is an incredibly important, you know, item and collectible thing. And today it's so hugely valuable. I mean, that people are defining it as its own asset class. We need to get really serious about, you know, how we take care of them. And I think that that is something that the next generation will just have the mindset of, whereas the old approach was, well, I'm gonna go out and find the best original example because that's the one that's best to restore. It's the easiest to restore. When we get our heads around the fact that that's not the right thing to do, it's for the next generation, there's, there isn't as big a learning curve. You know, Jay, you've got an appreciation for all sorts of cars. Do you agree with that? I mean, yeah, I, I have an old 911S that I drove down here that has the original paint kind of falling off of it, original interior, and there's stories to that. And, you know, you're right. It used to be somebody say, when are you going to paint that thing? Right. You don't hear that much anymore. Most people are like, that's cool, and they want to see the spider webs, and it's character, you know? It, it is character, and it's funny that you said it, you can tell a, a fake speedster or a cobra from a real one because that patina. I, 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 I don't think that will ever go out. I, I love preservation, and... It's crazy now, as you see on the lawn, people faking preservation. You're like, what? What world have we come to? They're, they're, they're faking patina and faking preservation, and it's just nuts, but it's cool. You know, Leslie, as you go about your mission of trying to educate people, do you think you'll introduce a component of preservation, of introducing something about how important it is to maintain originality in vehicles or showing off how original a vehicle is? I think that's absolutely essential because once you restore something, you have an approximation of the original. You have the bare bones, but it's not the original surface. The people in the day did not see what they're looking at on a restored car. They didn't see the original paint. They couldn't see the depth of color. They, couldn't, they didn't see the tread on the tires. They couldn't see the weave of the fabric. Um, and I think that's essential. And I think it will be um, more essential um, because we're just simply not going to be able to recreate what we're, what we're creating right now. Um, it's, it's, you know, if, uh, like you said about cars that are, are throwaway cars, if they, the only way they're going to they're be um, auto show or Concord eligible 
as if, as if they indeed are original. You know, I'm pretty soon you hear people talking about, oh my God, this has its original, you know, transistor part and the, you know, it, you know in, in some component. And it's like, really? It's like talking to somebody about a 1970s car and they're bragging about the original smog equipment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for those of us, I guess, Jay, that would be you and me and Leslie, depending on how stunted your growth was, um, growing up with the Jetsons, you know, we assume that in this point in time where we are now in 2021, we would have flying cars um, and that all these kind of older vehicles would be obsolete. Do you think there's at least some risk, and I'm going to ask each of you to answer, that the automobile in 2050 is obsolete and no one cares about them at all? Leslie? I think we'll always need some form of transportation, whether it's terrestrial or not. Uh, if, if we can start beaming each other around like they did on Star Trek, then no, we're not, not going to need cars. Cars are just around to get us from one place to another, except at the Concours, where they're supposed to be really cool, and they're, just, they're supposed to be your um, way to present yourself to the world. Um, and, and for that reason, it will, and it will always be the special cars. It will always be the one-of-a-kind, the cars that you just don't see unless you go to a show like this. Paul? Yeah, I, I'm hard to follow up. I mean, I think that's spot on. You know, it's, um, we live, fortunately live in a country in which cars are so important, right? So when we hear all this, you know, legislation in Europe of, you know, old cars not being allowed into city centers and things like that, that just seems like it could never happen here. I think there will be obviously limitations um, and changes that in the next 50 years will, next 25 years, that will surprise us. I mean, with any technology, I mean, the car 25 years from now will look so much different from a car, you know, what we've just seen in a 25 year spread. But um, it, I don't think it's the, the focus and importance of the automobile. And if you think of how passionate people are about them, um, I don't think they're going anywhere. Uh, whether we're using them daily or not. Jay? It's re it is very hard to say. I mean, individual ownership might change. We, we see things right now with, you know, autonomous vehicles where, you know, a car will come and pick you up and take you to work and go off and pick somebody else and come back. But, I, but we've also come out of this pandemic where I'm like, I actually want to be in my own car. I don't want to share it with 15 other people. Um, so, you know, culture and society is changing all the time. But what you said is so true is the United States, people, a lot of people in, in, in Europe don't understand that it's so vast here that so many people, unless you live in a city, which most of us don't live in a downtown of a city, we live in suburbs, you have to have some way of getting around. So, so I think the car will remain relevant for quite some time here to some degree. Caroline? I totally agree, and I, I think there's a lot of pessimists out there that say, oh, the, you know, the classic car world or the car world is going to die off, and I truly don't believe that. I mean, I go to Cars and Coffee, I live in LA, and every weekend there are hundreds of thousands of people lining up looking to see these cars, and young people, not just you know, our you know, older generation. And so th that's never gonna die. I mean, and these, you have to remember, the cars are history, right? You go into, you know, people still want to go to the Museum of Modern Art or they still want to go to the Louvre, right? They're still going to want to see these incredible cars and they're still, I, I don't think they're going away anytime soon. So Tabitha, what do you think about what we've been talking about? I think we're at an intersection of passion and purpose. And when we think about production vehicles, your daily drivers, it's a purpose-built uh, vehicle. But when we're talking about the Concorde world and the collector vehicles, it's passion. We don't have to have these cars. We want to have these cars. We want to celebrate and to enjoy them. So the purpose side, it's absolutely going to evolve over time. We're going to see at some point cities where we can't drive in. It might be geofenced or whatever it might be. The expans expansion of, of the, the Proximity of driving in the country is certainly a good point, um, but I think from a passion side of it, we will always have a demographic that wants to drive, that loves to drive, um, and as long as that, as long as we can be the good people in the room and show that driving is meaningful and it's not dangerous, doesn't have to be dangerous, and be the um, the nice people on the road that we're not waving the middle finger when somebody you know pulls out in front of us who doesn't understand that these classic cars have minimal brakes. Um, it's building that culture around this is more than just a hobby. It's something uh, industry-wide and it's also meaningful in our society and culture. Um, and that breaks it away from a purpose vehicle. 
Well, you know, on that note, I want to thank all of our panelists, certainly all of our distinguished guests in the front row. I'd like to thank all of you, um, especially our sponsor, AIG, who has for so long really supported the intellectual discussion around automobiles and the hobby. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you tomorrow morning. Thank you, and I hope to see you in 2050.